The Kraft Foods Company presents The Great Gildersleeve. Yeah. It's The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry, brought to you by the Kraft Foods Company, makers of a complete line of famous quality food products. Now let's see what goes on in Summerfield. Here's Unc. Hi, Unc. Hey, Unc, can I have some money to go to the movies tomorrow? There's a swell western at the Majestic. Piggy and I were going. Can you spare a little cash? Money? Certainly, my boy. What did you say? You can have the money, Leroy. Just mow the lawn tomorrow, and I'll give you 50 cents. Mow the lawn? In my vacation? Unc. No better time to mow it than vacation. Looks like a hayfield out there. But, Unc, we're supposed to go back to school feeling refreshed. Teacher said so. I'm supposed to rest. You get plenty of rest, Leroy. What you need is something to rest from. Oh, Hello, Unc. He's Ben called. He says the car is all fixed, and he's bringing it around before supper. Do you think we could ask him to stay? I guess so. I thought you looked a little dressed up. Oh, Unc, just because I put on stockings. <laughs> It's all right, my dear. Nothing to be ashamed of, especially now that Ben's got a job. No telling what he may think of next. Oh, stop. I wish it were a different kind of a job. What's the matter with it? This is the kind of job Ben likes, the kind he's good at. He never was cut out for insurance. I can't imagine why he ever tried it. You talked him into it while he was still punchy from the Navy. Uh. <laughs> well, this time I found the right place for it. Yes, sir, he'll thank me the rest of his life for this job. Ben has a real gift for mechanics. He can't be very good at it. His hands get so dirty. My dear. <laughs> That's the way the work of the world gets done. Dirty hands are the mark of honest toil. Oh, all right. Just the same, I wish he had one of those jobs where you carry a briefcase. <laughs> Nonsense. Ben isn't the kind of a fellow... Excuse me, Mr. Gilfried. Mr. Bullard's been trying to get you on the phone. Oh, yes, I forgot to tell you. Oh, Bullard, eh? Well, who talked to him? You or Bertie? I guess we both did. He tried you two, three times. He said he'd call you later. Oh, uh, wonder if I should call him. Better not. I might disturb him. Any other messages? No, sir, except supper will be ready in a few minutes. Oh, that's good. Is there enough to set an extra place for Ben, Bertie? Yes, sir. I already set it. Well? <laughs> <laughs> Miss Marjorie, where ahead of you, Miss Gilfrey? Marjorie, I think you might have consulted me. I did. Well, I know, but... Hey, uh, get in the car! Well, you don't have to shout like that. Come on, Marjorie. But in the future, kindly remember... Well, Ben, you finally got here. Yep. I'm here. Hiya, Ben. Hey, Unc, he's towing a motorcycle. Hi, Leroy. Hello, Marge. Ben, those overalls. See? What's the matter with them? You didn't tell me you had to wear a sign on your back. Well, uh, Bud Panella, day and night service. <laughs> I think it's me. Sure. Besides, it's important. This is the only all-night garage in town. Mr. Panella's proud of it. You look fine, Ben. Now, let me hear that motor. Okay. Huh. There. How's that? Well, oh, by George, you wouldn't think it was the same engine. Smooth. Well, I reboard the cylinders and put in all new rings and new set of spark plugs and new fan belt. Fan was making a lot of racket under there, you know. Is that what that was? Uh-huh. Well, I did some work on the clutch. You get that crunch out of it? Sure. I think you'll be pretty happy with it now, Mr. Gildersleeve. Want to take her around the block? Not just now, Ben. We're about to have supper. Why don't you stay and join us? Oh, no thanks. I couldn't. Got to get back to the shop. On the motorcycle? Yep. For goodness sake. How long do you have to work? Well, I'm on duty till 10 tonight. Mr. Pinella says it's the most important shift he has. That's the stuff. Hmm? I told Pinella you were a good man, Ben. I told him he'd have to watch his step or you'd own the business inside of a couple of years. You did? You see, I don't think he'd like that, Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> well, don't worry. You just do your job. And... <laughs> you just do your job, Ben, and Bud will treat you right. How much do you make, Ben? Well, I... Leroy. We don't ask that, Leroy. 
You want an hourly basis, Ben? Yes, sir. Around a dollar and a half an hour? Yep. Unky! Well, that's okay, Marge. After all, see, your uncle got me the job. I'm sure obliged to you, too, Mr. Gildersleeve. Keep nothing of it, my boy. Just stick at it, and you'll be an automotive tycoon before you know it. Well, I don't know about that, but it's nice to have a little money coming in so Mob don't have to worry about the rent. I'd like to buy her washing machine, too, if I can save or not. Don't worry, Ben. By the time you find one for sale, you'll have the money. Mr. <laughs> Green, stop us on the table. All right, Bertie. Sure you can't reconsider, Ben? I'm oh, sorry. Mr. Pinella's counting on me. Oh, poo on Mr. Pinella. Marge, he's my boss. Look, honey, I get off at 8 o'clock Saturdays. How about Saturday night, Marge? I'll consider it. Thanks. Well, i better shove off. Hey, Uncle, could I ride a little ways with him on the motorcycle? No, Leroy. It'll be dangerous enough just watching from here. <laughs> well, so long. Goodbye. Goodbye, Ben. So long. Mr. Kilsley's supper's ready, and this time I mean positively. Oh, come on, kids. Supper. <laughs> Pass the rolls, will you please, Leroy? Here. Not one roll. I said rolls. Zzz. Pass the plate. There's only one roll on it. It's considered more delicate to hand a person the plate, Leroy, rather than touch the food itself. Skip it, Unky. It spoils my appetite to think about Leroy's manners. Yes, mine too. <laughs> All right, let's have a pleasant conversation for the rest of the meal. How's uh, spring vacation so far? It's too short. Before it even gets started, it's half over. You have to go back to school Monday, Leroy? Sure, don't you? Not till Tuesday. It must be great to be in high school. Yeah. <laughs> You'll be there one of these days, Leroy. I hope. <laughs> what did you do today, infants? Nothing. Nothing? Nothing? What's the matter with you? A beautiful spring day? There's a million wonderful things to do on a day like this. How did you spend it, actually? I went to the movies this afternoon. You see, she's got money. You do half an hour's work on the lawn and you'll have money too, my boy. What's more, I'll bet you had just as much fun as Marjorie this afternoon. What'd you do, Leroy? Nothing. I watched them move a streetcar up the street onto a vacant lot. Streetcar? Vacant lot? What are you talking about? A streetcar with the wheels off. They moved it onto that vacant lot between Parsons and Old Man Sears. People are going to live in it. Really? I think that's cute. Uh, a regular streetcar, Leroy? Sure. Still got the roller sign in the window. It says Main Street and State Street and car barns only. <laughs> I certainly don't see how anybody could live in a streetcar. You could fix it up so it'd be sweet, Unky. Curtains in the window and roses around the door. I don't know. I've never seen a streetcar with plumbing in it. <laughs> Leroy, cut that bite in half. Okay. I think a streetcar would be much cuter than a trailer. It'd be such fun to invite your friends to. You'll go! Bertie will go. I'll go! Who the devil would come to call at this hour? This is time for eating, not ringing doorbells. Bertie, if that's some kid, tell him to go home. Yes, sir, I'll tell him. And tell him to wait outside, Bertie. Tell him to go home, Bertie. Yes, sir. Good evening. Is Mr. Gildersleeve at home? Yes, sir, he is. Come right in. Uh, ooh, that's Rumps and Bullard. Well, pull up another chair there, Leroy. Marjorie, tell Bertie to set another place. Oh, hello, Bullard. Hello. <laughs> hey, won't you join us? Oh, uh, no, no, thank you, Gildersleeve. I'm sorry to interrupt your meal, but a matter has come up of transcendent importance to the whole neighborhood. Is, is that so? Yes, yes. As a property owner, you'll be most interested, I'm certain. Are you aware that a streetcar is being moved into the vacant lot in the next block? Well, uh, Leroy was telling me something. Yes, it's true. Imagine. A streetcar. Obviously, it will be an eyesore to begin with. But when you think of the kind of riffraff who may be planning to live in it, well, do you see what it will do to the values of property on this street? No. What? It'll ruin them, that's all. We have a neighborhood of some distinction at present. What we've got to do is restrict it. Allow no new houses that cost less than 10000 to construct. 10000 Why, this house of mine only costs six. Oh, well, it's worth far more today. 
Uh, worth 12 to 15 easily. <laughs> well, you don't say. Well, of course, if the neighborhood is kept up. This thing is a serious challenge to our democratic rights, Gildersleeve. Yes, now, yes. I'm organizing a protest. Legal steps, petition, and so on. If you'd care to join me, naturally your public position would be of great assistance. Well, if you put it that way, anything that's good for the city, I'm for. Yes, good for the city. And uh, good for ourselves. Oh. Uh, can I count on you? Oh, absolutely. Well, I'm very much obliged to you, Gildersleeve. No, no, don't bother to let me out. Sorry to have interrupted your dinner. How do you like that? He never even said hello. Yeah. Don't criticize Mr. Bullard's manners, Leroy. He's a very fine man. Well, he is. Eat those carrots. After that big Easter dinner, the family is probably sitting around without a thought about the next meal. But you, Mother, no doubt, have been planning ahead, deciding on the best way to serve those leftovers. Well, that's pretty easy if you happen to have a package of smooth-melting Velveeta. That leftover ham or chicken or those vegetables will score a quick and appetizing comeback when served with a rich golden cheese sauce, made the easy way with Velveeta. Just put one half pound of this famous cheese food in the top of your double boiler, and when it's melted down, stir in one quarter cup of milk. There's your Velveeta sauce, as easy as that. A satin smooth cheese sauce that adds wonderful flavor, richness, and fine food value to your leftovers. Yes, Velveeta adds high quality, complete protein, plus food energy, milk minerals, vitamin A, and riboflavin. So for fine food value, for rich yet mild cheddar cheese flavor, for smooth-melting golden goodness that glamorizes leftovers, be sure to get a package of genuine Velveeta, the cheese food of craft quality. <laughs> Now let's get back to the great Gildersleeve. He has been convinced by his persuasive neighbor that the little trolley car which is being converted into a residence up the street is a menace to the whole community. And so, like a modern Paul Revere, he sets off, armed with a petition, to rouse the sleepy burgers of Summerfield. Madam, do you know what's going on right up the street? No, what? Sign here, right on the line there. But I... Just sign. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. But what's going on? I'll have to tell you later. I'm in a rush. We've already got one. Yeah, wait a minute. I'm not selling anything, mister. Gildersleeve's my name, Throckmorton P. Perhaps you've heard of me. What do you want? Uh, I want to ask you a question. How would you like it if somebody was to build a gas station on that empty lot right across from you there? A gas station? Don't think it couldn't happen. The fellow just moved a trolley car onto a lot up the street. What we need in this town is some decent restrictions. Now, I have a petition here. I'll sign. Let's have it. Uh, here, use my pen. Mm. Uh, by the way, Mr... Golnick. Uh, uh, by the way, Mr. Golnick, what line are you in? Gas stations. <laughs> hmm. Thank you very much. Look, Leela, I've got something here I'd like to have you sign. It's a petition. For me? Well, no, it's for the town council. <laughs> but I'd like to have you sign it. Oh, aren't you sweet? I just love signing my name to things. That's one of the things I have to watch out for, as a matter of fact. Oh, well, you don't have My to. husband, Beauregard, when he was alive, he wouldn't let me sign a thing. I know, but Leela... Leela Child, he used to say to me, never sign anything unless you've read it all the way through and you're sure you understand it. So that's what I did. I never signed anything. Well... <laughs> uh, uh, this is different, Leela. This is just a simple little petition. 
Is that anything like a subpoena? No, no, no. <laughs> no, this is nothing. Oh, why don't you come in and explain to me all about it? I love it when you explain to me about things. <laughs> Well, I'd like to, Leela, but I haven't got time. The town council is holding a public uh, hearing this afternoon, and we have to have it in by then. You're going to have every Tom, Dick, and Harry to shine in it. I'd hardly be interested but in But this is a public petition, Leela. That's how public petitions work. Everybody signs them. Oh? That's the only way they mean anything. Well, I don't know. Beauregard always told me that... Look, Leela... You trust me, don't you? Trust you? Gracious, I should say not. <laughs> I don't trust any man. That's another thing Beauregard taught me. All right. You don't have to trust me, Leela, then. Just, just sign it. But I don't understand. You don't have I... to understand it. Just do as I tell you. Sign it. No. Confound it, you're just like Marjorie, Leela. That's the trouble with you women. You're not practical. But it would be so dumb. Darling, why do you know how much that thing is going to cost when they get it finished? Maybe eight or nine hundred dollars, not even a thousand at the most. Isn't that wonderful? It's not wonderful at all. It's going to reduce the value of every house in this neighborhood if we don't put a stop to it. How would you like it if you had to sell your house and you found the value of it had been cut in half? What would you do, Leela? Where would you go? I'd go live in a trolley car. With oh, Ram nonsense. <laughs> I can't make any sense out of you, Leela. You don't listen to a word I ever say. You aren't fit to own property or anything else. You ought to have a guardian. You hear that? You ought to have a guardian. I'd love one. Do you know of any? I better get out of here. Oh, Grandma, Grandma, wait. Well? Aren't you going to let me sign your petition? Let you? What do you think I've been trying to do for the past half hour? Well, give me your pen. That's the girl. Here. Right on the line there. I just hope Beauregard isn't watching. That's all. <laughs> Well, thanks, Leela. With your signature, that makes it 100% unanimous so far. So thanks a lot. Oh, don't thank me. I'm glad to sign. Well, thanks. After all, who knows? I might want to live in a trolley car myself someday. Sure. Huh? <laughs> oh, well, never mind. <laughs> Got to run now. <laughs> Bye-bye. Beauregard was right. <laughs> not the trolley car. I've got nothing against trolley cars. It's the principle of the thing. Why, do you know what would happen if we don't put a stop to this? The whole town could go to pot. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> it's true, Peavy. Unless we get some restrictions with teeth in them here. Well, you're not so safe, you know. You've got an empty lot next door to you. How'd you like to see a trolley car moved in there? Well, Mr. Jones, I'll tell you. I figure nobody wants to live in a trolley car. Maybe so. I figure if a man lives in a trolley car, it's because he hasn't got any other place to live. That's his tough luck. He doesn't have to run down my place by moving into the same neighborhood. Well, he has to move somewhere. Well, let him move somewhere else. Mr. Jogerty, do you ever read the Bible? Well, yes. Certainly I read the Bible. As much as most people. Did you ever read that story in there about the Good Samaritan? I was lying in the street, all beaten up, and people kept passing yes, by. Yes, yes, I know all about that, TV. That's all very well. But while we're quoting the Bible, there's another saying in there. Uh, am I my brother's keeper? You know who said that? I don't know who said it, but it's in the Bible. The man who said that was Cain, the first murderer. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has got nothing to do with the Bible anyway. I take it you refuse to sign my petition. Is that it? Well, I wouldn't say I refuse. You will sign it then? Well, I wouldn't say that either. <laughs> Mr. Bullard is in on this too, is he? You bet your life. He's a pretty smart operator, Bullard. The rest of us wouldn't do badly just to tag along with him. Well, how about it, Peavy? Yes or no? Now, if you don't mind, Mr. Goodley, please, I, I don't think I'll tag along. All right, don't. We don't need you anyway. Five gallons, that's a dollar even But let me catch that windshield for you, Mr. Gildersleeve uh, Thanks, Ben uh, Sorry to hear your mother's not feeling well Well, she's a little upset, Mr. Gildersleeve I guess we're going to have to move Move? Move where? That's what we'd like to know just got the notice yesterday. The fellow that owns the house we're renting wants to sell it. Well, 
Something is bound to turn up. Don't worry. I guess you haven't looked for any houses lately, Mr. Gildersleeve. I know fellas have been out of service for three months, and they still haven't found a place. Don't give up hope, Ben. There's still time. Now, what good is that? Nobody's doing anything about it. Ah, oh, the heck with it. I think I'll join the Army. Ben, why do that? Why join the Army? Well, I was in the Navy. <laughs> But just when you're getting settled, Ben, you've got a good job here. You're doing fine. But what good is that if you haven't got a place to live? See, I thought when I get out of the service, I could come home and get a job and take care of Mom and make things nice for her and maybe go to night school. I was all full of plans and junk. Now it looks like she'll have to go and live with her sister in Akron, and I'll have to give up this job and go back to something I hate. Ben, I can't stand to hear you talk. Like that. Well, that's the way it is. We won't let you leave Summerfield, Ben. Why, Marjorie, you'd never get over it. Neither would the rest of us. We'd all miss you. Now, don't you worry, Ben. I've got a little influence in this town. I'll see that you're taken care of. Well, I don't think I want to live in a town where a fella has to have influence to get an even break. Ben. And I know a lot of other fellas that feel the same way. We want to go back to the Navy, even. Why? <laughs> I know one fella, he was so hard up for a place to live, he went and bought himself a trolley car. Was going to make himself a house out of that. Now I hear they're even trying to make it tough for him. Uh, Ben. Well, uh, heck with it. They can take their GI loans and their GI Bill of Rights and all the rest of that GI hot air, and they can... Ben! Well, they can. <laughs> ben, my boy, do nothing till you hear from me. Understand? Do nothing till you hear from me. <laughs> to you as homeowners, as well as members of the city council, to take action on this matter while there is still time. The issue is clear. Shall Summerfield continue to be known as the city of home, the city of gracious living, or shall it become an overgrown trailer park, a virtual shanty town? Council thanks Mr. Bullard for his expression of opinion at this time. I'm sure If that... I might be permitted another word, Mr. Chairman. Yes? I had hoped, in fact, I had expected that my colleague, our esteemed water commissioner, Mr. Throckmorton T. Gildersleeve, would be here this afternoon to add his words to mine. I cannot imagine what has detained him, Don't but... Don't worry, I'm here. Uh, here he is. Yeah, yeah. It's quiet, Leroy. Pardon me, ma'am. Uh, pardon me. Uh, Mr. Gildersleeve. Are you through, Bullard? Uh, uh, why, yes. Then sit down. Well. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the council, citizens of Summerfield, I'm sorry I'm late. I don't know what Mr. Bullard's been saying to you, but I can imagine, because I darn near made the same mistake myself. Gildersleeve, what are you up to? Quiet. Let me ask you people a question. What is Summerfield? Is it a collection of $10,000 houses? Is it a group of well-kept lawns? Or is it people? It's people! <laughs> <laughs> uh, my little nephew. Thank you, Leroy. <laughs> With just the same pipe down, will you? Folks, uh, the point I want to make is this. The biggest asset we have in Summerfield, the biggest asset in any town, is not its real estate, but its people. Our greatest obligation is to them to the old people who have made Summerfield what it is, to the young people who will make it what it will be. There are people in this town who haven't got a roof over their head. There'll be more coming back from the war. There are families that have been broken up for want of a place to live. Now, I've just been talking to Ben Waterford. You all know Ben. Ben's been in the Navy for three years, fighting, while you and I were back here, safe as a church. Now he comes back and gets himself a new job. Then all of a sudden, he and his mother find themselves with no place to live. Mr. Bullard here might say that that's Ben's tough luck. Now, just a minute. Oh, yes, you would. <laughs> well, I say Ben's tough luck is our tough luck. I confound it, Ben's fixed my clutch for me like you, after it'd been giving me trouble all through the war. I say we need more men like that in Summerfield. You tell him, Mom! <laughs> I'm not just talking about Ben. There are hundreds of others like him. We've got an emergency here, and we better recognize it. This is no time to be spending our days figuring how to pass restrictions and keep houses from being built. We need more houses. 
Let's get a roof over everybody's head first, then we can start dolling them up. Uh, thank you. It's just like the war. We were never up against anything like that before, but we licked it. And if we get together, we can lick this. Don't tell me Summerfield can't take care of its own people. Just a minute, please. Just one minute. Quiet, please. There's a gentleman there I think would like to be heard. Don't you step up here, please, so we can hear you. Well, all I said was, bully for Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, uh, bully for you, too, Peavy. Uh, folks, I want to make a little confession. As some of you know, I've been going around town like our friend Bullard, circulating one of those darn fool petitions. And I want to say here and now that the only man I ran into who refused to sign it was Mr. Peavy here. Peavy is the only man in this town who's got any sense. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, for several years, it's been our privilege to have James L. Kraft, the founder of our company, join us on Easter Sunday broadcast. Today, we again invite you to share in the inspiration of his Easter message. I'd like to read Mr. Kraft's message. This Easter Sunday is, in many respects, the most stirring in the memory of any of us alive today. The day is always profoundly moving, most sacred in our Christian calendar, offering comfort for those who have sustained loss, renewing faith in a way not of life alone, but of immortal life. Coming as it does at the season of grass and bloom, of spring and hope, Easter Sunday has been the symbol of the Christian's deepest faith since that day long ago when the stone was rolled away from a faraway tomb. But I believe that this Easter Sunday of 1946 is far more than a holy symbol for Christendom. I believe it to be a flowering hope and a promise for all mankind. As the world emerges from war and looks with great yearning toward true peace, Easter has a special message for all of us. That message is one of courage to face the tremendous tasks which lie ahead, tasks of building a lasting peace. The way is difficult. How difficult, we're only beginning to see. But the way was clearly pointed by him whose resurrection we mark today. If peace is to be won, then men must learn to live as brothers, in small groups and large, in communities and nations. Now in this critical time in the history of civilization, it's squarely up to men to make their choice. They must learn to live together, work together, and plan together for the common good of all, or perish from the earth. The life and the teaching of him who died on the cross and rose again offers the greatest example to all thinking men that we can, if we will, achieve this highest goal, harmony and peace. Easter speaks to the whole world of a triumphant way of life, a spirit among men which would enable them to transcend all their problems. It speaks of one who gave his life for that ideal, and who triumphed over the forces of even death itself. Amid the uncertainties, the confusion, the perplexities and problems of this present-day world, Easter renews our faith and our conviction. Out of the wintertime of the world's despair can grow the springtime of its hope. May this Easter of 1946 bring to all men everywhere the faith to fight the good fight of human brotherhood, to work for our great common dream of peace on earth. Thank you. National Broadcasting Company.